Do we have a proximal radius plane? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there is five phone calls just to figure out something that, that you already knew. So, Max, thank you for joining us uh, to, to this episode on the, the um, applications of AI in trauma surgery. Uh, Max, you're, you've been a, you have a long track record in this field. You started in uh, around 2014 uh, with a research regarding the application of a computer science in the field of orthopedics. And then you went on to publish one of the most uh, important papers regarding the uh, Analysis of orthopedic trauma in or, or you know or fractures in radiographs, and then you went on to uh, be the founder of the Care Lab in the Karolinska Institute, which is a dedicated lab for the application of AI technology, or AI in orthopedic surgery, and all this while um, continuing your education and now becoming a senior orthopedic mm -hmm. consultant in one of the most renowned uh, hospitals. So I think. You have, uh, of course, the professional background to to kind of guide the rest of the orthopedic and trauma community into what is next to come in the in the years. So maybe we could start by by throwing the most burning question out there. So from your perspective and experience, how do you think that artificial intelligence is affecting the world of ortho and trauma now, and where do we go from it? Well, what we see now is that. I, I view it as there are several stages along the way. We're at the very first stage. So we were seeing at our hospital, there are CE marked applications coming in that can identify fractures. Um, as we know, usually we already know there's a fracture before we send the patient to x-rays. Uh, so, so the value added for us there is perhaps not that great but the value added for younger surgeons or younger colleagues uh, and perhaps colleagues in other fields uh, is much larger so so there you have so this it's a very very first basic and that was our paper in 2017 that that was what it was about uh, can we find a fracture and then the answer was of, of course yes that wasn't a, a, that obvious in the beginning but but it turned out yeah we we, we can find it uh, and and I would say it's the foundation for the next step. Um, when we look at how this will impact orthopedics, I, I think that the next step that we want to find, that, that we found in our research and our experience, is that you want to really understand not only that there is a fracture, but what type of fracture, how do we should we treat it, what are... Uh, the pitfalls of this type of fractures, what should you look for. So you, you, you want to basically have the AI support together with the knowledge that we have. So, so that's, that's the next step. If, if, we, if we can identify really what we have in the picture, we can also tell you what to do. Like the simple case, uh, we did a tibia fracture today. If you have a tibia fracture of a certain uh, combination, there's a high risk of compartment. You should have a compartment uh, observation of this patient. It's a very useful utility to have. Uh, and then, then you go into like what kind of treatment options. Like ideally, you would like to have. Uh, this is the the fracture uh, we have. What what plates do we have? What, what nails do we have that actually work with this thing? I, I don't know how many hours a day I spend on trying. Do we do we have a proximal <laughs> radius plate? <Yeah. laughs> that was this this week's big question. Was like, how 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 can we not have a proximal? And where is this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there is five phone calls just to figure out something that that you already knew. Yeah, so, and, and I knew that from from uh, from the radiograph. So, so I, I uh, the radiograph, uh, the information was there. I, if I could connect this to our system of uh, storage, then then this would be a solved problem. And th this is like not what people think about AI. Like uh, when you look at Terminator and those kind of cool movies, like this is very uh, like just useful just nice to have yeah. but i think that would be like when when you think of 
how will this affect the orthopedic community? I, I think that's where we will be seeing the large uh, headways coming, where, where we we will actually be be guided, be helped by by um, the uh, output from the AI. But then, mm-hmm. like once we we have that. I, I think that there there are plenty of like it, it branches off very very nicely into different features. Like for from a research perspective, uh, what we've been doing lately is we've been looking at uh, complications. Like, uh, so so we have our large database and and we can like how, which hip fractures uh, fail uh, during this twenty year period in Stockholm. I, I can easily do that. Uh, once I have a, a working AI model, I can easily deploy that on all of the fractures in Stockholm and and have that back within one or two days. Um, so, so I think that will provide us a lot of interesting insights. Uh, a lot of these studies where we have reviewed a hundred, a thousand cases at this center, and you don't know exactly the bias and all that. So you can do that on a massive scale and gain incredible insights uh, and, yes. and the, the second part is of course like really well we we know what like this is a b2 fracture this is an a1 fracture and, and all of those classes but uh we don't know how well they really correlate so we can have the network find features classes on its own that that are important i think that one of the most interesting uh research like when I started, was that this breast cancer group had, had done uh, on histopathology, where they looked at the um, features in just regular breast cancer histopathology, and they, they asked, "So, we, what what features are important?" And then the the model picked out, I think, nine or ten features. Eight of them, or something like that, were known from before, so they confirmed what we already know. But then they found new features. They were incredibly interesting. In this case, they were, they were the model was looking at healthy tissue, and once you go back, of course, yeah, yeah, it's it's a balance between healthy and and sick tissue. It's not only the sick tissue that we've always been been focused on. I think in orthopedics, that's going to be incredibly interesting once we go into like uh, what is actually causing pain down the line. What is actually what what, what features are causing this these uh, cases to fail. Uh, we will find the same things we've been always finding. Hopefully, if we if our research has been found the yeah, last exactly. hundred years, we we will confirm what we already know in in, in the many parts. But but it'll be incredibly interesting to see what new features we'll find, and we will probably be much better like telling our patients like, so you well if if I give you a plate, you you have a a much uh, more uh, precise uh, reposition and and your risk of uh, uh, osteoarthritis down the road is is uh, smaller. But if I, if I give you a nail, uh, the healing is better and you'll have better function. And and uh, in some parts, and and the patient will be. I think when when you talk about patient engagement, that's really where it comes down to. Like what what feature are my most important? Uh, for me, like, uh, do do I really need to be able to run, or do I want to be quick out and walking and, and having a, a yeah. problem-free solution that that is safe uh, for me? Um, and th- these are the, the decisions that we now uh, help our patient through. But I think we we carry a lot of that decision burden because it's hard to really it's put a number. Better on it like what how much percentage risk is it for one or the other uh treatment but once you have exactly what the patient asks you right yeah yeah. they they come and and they are used to maybe they've seen in some series or or some uh uh, they've heard from uh from another colleague that the doctor told them that there was a risk associated to this type of treatment which is something now we can just very very generally give but i really like that that you went direct into the classification of the fracture because that's a feedback that i've been uh, getting in the last time uh, that most surgeons say yeah but what's the use you know we we anyway classify this but you know we're using these classifications since 50 years maybe even since 70 years 
without all the new advancements in, in imaging and um, also all the diagnostic possibilities that we have today. So maybe a combination of those data. And I, I know that you've been doing uh, lots of research in every um, joint and every part of the body regarding classification could give us, like you say, an ex a, a better classification aimed exactly to the exit or, or to the success of the, the different methodologies of treatment. And yeah, now, yeah. So, so you want ideally, you you know, I, the classification is is the poor man's by method for for dealing with uh, trying to group poor and bad outcomes or how to do different treatment options. But but uh, that's you. The classification is only useful that far. You really want that that piece of like how high is the risk with this? Which features should I be scared of like uh when you do fracture reposition w w where should you put most work on what what is the most important thing uh, like, uh, uh is it is it the uh, anterolateral part that i should uh, make sure that that's perfect and then, then perhaps the, the the rest is is less important we we really don't know like we 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 fumble in the dark uh, there i think where um uh in our treatments and now i think like when you when you think of like what can ai bring us um think of it traditionally we we built our all our statistical research models uh on sex we've had smoking we've had a few types of different fractures and, and then we we look what happens now you still have sex smoking but you can just input the entire image of the patient into the model like that's that's suddenly possible it has never ever been possible before and and now we can do that uh, so that, that opens up incredible possibilities uh for us so um and and, and uh, it's it's hard to say where it goes I, it, there's so many like different avenues uh, i think like uh imaging in general, all kinds of imaging, it's going to be incredibly fruitful for for AI. That's that's mm -hmm. like a, a natural target. It was where AI first had its major breakthrough. Um, language, uh, as you and I have been been uh, discussing, uh, that has been my major disappointment mm -hmm. <laughs> the last ten years. But like since ChatGPT uh, appeared, it suddenly yeah. just works. Yeah. Uh, which uh, I think, if you ask the AI community, everyone is shocked by this. Uh, one back in, uh, when we started, uh, we were looking at uh, people asking, you know, what, what what's coming and what's what's happening?" And I, I was like, "Well, self-driving cars seem to be like a, a low-hanging fruit uh, back then." But then you realize now, with hindsight bias, that yes kind of like there's money to be made or if you can replace a bus driver with with an algorithm that's, that's a huge like cash flow in just directly um but the problem is the cost is so high like, like having a bus driver that hits someone is it, bad but having an algorithm that hits someone just destroys the entire I, you've seen what happened to the uber self-driving uh the, I, th I think they closed it down i don't know if they what happened but pretty bad uh, things well that's a really important ethical point of this uh of, of the and it's also an often often the most asked question so are these technologies aimed to replace surgeons i know you always say yeah. these are meant to augment surgeons but how can a surgeon who is new to ai in ortho expect that uh, or what improvements can surgeons expect using AI tools? Well, I, I think I, there's going to be plenty of uh, companies that, that try to uh, push AI robots and stuff like that, but it, it's going to be a fancier drill, as I see it. It's, it's, um, and, and so far, from what I understand, I haven't used that many robot uh, surgical tools, but it's hard to imagine that they will be faster than humans in the surgical, in the operating theater uh, with the same safety that, that you would require from a robot. 
Um, so I, I think I, it's uh, when when you look at when Leonardo uh, the the uh, robot came, it it was a very interesting development, but it became mostly a tool for uh, making uh, making it uh, like selling your clinic. Like we have a robot surgeon. Uh, we do robot surgery and you, we have excellent results we we this is the coolest latest tech uh so I, but i i don't really see that um at the same scale in, in orthopedics at least not in sweden where where the throughput is much much more important uh and uh, doing one more arthroplasty or one more fracture whatever you're doing is is just so much more money than than having a, a slightly higher attraction uh, rate, so um, uh, so I, I, and and uh, yeah, the, like robotics, it's uh, that is so high stakes. If if a bus driver is high stakes, robotics, uh, robotic surgery in the operating theater is going to be super high stakes. So so I don't yeah. see that that's going to be happening on a wild scale. But then again, I was wrong about. That. <laughs> I thought the the self driving cars would be a reality by now. So, okay. I mean, um, it, of course, it, it needs a lot of work for the for the for the young resident now uh, aiming to. You know, we're hearing a lot of AI. Uh, our bosses are telling us, you know, yeah, I'm doing. I've been doing this for forty five years in this way, and I never needed a computer to do it better. Um, where would you say it's relevant that the young and maybe middle age uh, yeah. orthopedics well, go well, in? Yeah, there was this like super interesting study uh, from Sydney. They looked at uh, the surgeries they were doing. Uh, are you familiar with that? They had like nine thousand surgeries, uh, and they went um, into categorize them, and uh, like half of them didn't have any evidence. Like, well, like mostly. It, the older guy was doing this. I'm gonna do this, <laughs> and uh, I mean, it's, uh, some we know how, how it is. It's really hard to find ten patients of that particular fracture type sometimes, and uh, yeah. uh, or or whatever you're doing. There, there are a lot of special cases. The, the 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 field that we're working in is so incredibly wide uh, that it's really hard to to understand how how many options you have there before you start working with them but but then in the other half where they had evidence where they had good high quality randomized controlled trials well they only used them in half of the time Uh (laughs) so so i was like the most disappointing research era uh, like if if i was and and i think the problem you have there is is these older surgeons are are like oh i always been doing it like this like why should i bother changing this is has been working for so many years um yes it 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 does but there is sometimes much better options out there um that that you can look at you can um probably have uh, more uh, like custom tailored solutions to patients uh, and not everything uh, that looks like a nail needs a hammer uh, mm-hmm. and and that old uh, discussion so so i think what hopefully when how this will affect younger surgeons uh, i would expect that you you get much more this entire field of knowledge that we've been gathering the last 100 200 years in orthopedics is going to be presented in a much more accessible way yeah uh so um i i think like uh, just um if if you look at all the papers out there there's no there's no immediate need for the next research paper to be published. I think there are plenty <laughs> out there. I I don't have the time to re- reach them, read them all, despite me being a senior researcher. And I think no one really has that. So we're at the cusp of we're generating more and more knowledge, and and, and it's going out into this void where maybe a few people read it if you're lucky, but but it's uh, uh, becoming incredibly hard to overview it. But now, as we have these language models, these large language models, suddenly you can. Um, and I've seen people uh, when, when I review grant applications, people are now looking at how can we 
use these language models to go into all the research and find the relevant data that we're interested in. Suddenly that's possible. You, you, you don't have to scan through like tons of uh, papers in order to find one or two. I, I think the whole, if, if you look at like meta-analysis, I mean, that's, that's, that's a field that's going to be completely changed. No one's going to be like, we, we extracted 10,000 papers and then we looked through five, all of the abstracts and we found 20 papers that we looked into. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The whole, the whole thing is like absurd. Like uh, how, 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 do, what was the filter for 10,000 papers? How did you end up with 20 in them? Like there's something real weird going on there. Uh, so I, I think uh, the whole research field is going to really be affected by this because like the meta-analysis, it's going to be, it's not like you do one meta-analysis. You probably have a search engine for different exactly, uh, real radio time structure. Cool. Yeah. You know how many radio, I, I didn't, uh, on PubMed, I did a just search with randomized control trial, distal radius. I, I, I got 300 hits on that. <laughs> Over 300. Like it, it's, I have no idea what they're all about. A lot of them I had never known that were out there. So, so I think uh, we need to have made that, make that uh, knowledge more accessible. That's really gonna be, uh, and and that's that. I just as self driving cars and and uh, language. This is a low hanging fruit. This is a really we're we're not cutting anyone open. We're not suggesting a particular treatment. We're only picking out the relevant information okay and and okay. ideally we also like so so you don't need to read all these papers from scratch you have a summary and then you can look in and and look up uh, details uh, i mean a lot of the papers uh, are can be tricky to read sometimes and and hard to follow uh, even papers that i've written aren't always that great yeah i mean <laughs> Uh, just for sure, I was in a in a course recently, and the editor of the um, of the JBJS journal, the doctor um, Siontowski, was talking about. He was even saying, "Don't do any more, don't do reviews anymore. You know, don't don't waste your time doing reviews because by the time you publish, they're already obsolete, and and we're already working in a tool which is going to be uh, developing real time um, analysis and or meta analysis. So just don't give a bother. But as a, as um. Maybe just going back to the classification problem, uh, you've done proximal, you've done tibia fractures, ankle fractures, distal radius fractures. How accurate are the models? Or asked in another way, when when a surgeon sees the picture, you're also imagining the tensions, the muscles, everything that's around in the picture. The model is calculating differences between pixels. Yeah, yeah. So, so oh, our yeah. our approach has been like. Uh, we uh, we had a PhD from from uh, a postdoc from from uh, the technical university that helped us start, and we discussed this a lot in the beginning. And and should you have a hierarchical? Well, this is a B one two fracture, or and and my thought was that it's never that simple. So you have you have the image, and then you have additional knowledge. So so and and. You're never going to be able to to have all that additional knowledge available. Uh, some of it's going to be subjective. So, so what we always uh, do is we predict all types of uh, classes and and the probability from them. Sometimes there's a very high probability for a certain class, and and it's clearly that in this open shot case. But a lot of time, maybe half of the the possible classes are. Uh, uh, discarded, and then you have maybe one or two decisions you have to do on your own. So it's mm -hmm. not like you have to go through an entire AO OTA trauma tree and then find that that single. Uh, you just have to like, is it this or this? Like, uh, do you have medial pain? You don't have medial pain. Really, like, uh, just do add the value where it's most uh, needed to to the picture. But I don't think like. Uh, classifications can be entirely solved only by a radiograph because all the, all the information is simply not there that that you need uh, for the task. But it, it's it's enough to do a lot of interesting stuff. So.
and make our lives easier, hopefully. I mean, and, and maybe for as a closing statement, how do you envision the, the ideal in the clinic in 50 years? How will be your daily life, let's say, with a trauma case, a patient with, a, with an ankle fracture is coming to the emergency? How will AI come into play? Well, I, I do. I, I really want to see this uh, vision where we go to a patient and say, well, this, this is a fracture. We need to treat it surgically. We have these options. These, for your particular fracture, these are the expected outcomes and, and these are the risk patterns that, that you look at depending on the option. And then you have that information not only standardized in some format as we but adapted to the patient's cognitive ability to take in that information it's going to be incredibly different if you have someone with a, a, a research background or technical background or someone who's uh, perhaps working uh, in uh, a restaurant and then that 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 flexibility, I hope, will be there, and mm -hmm. uh, I think also during surgery we'll have much more uh, vision guidance. Like, so, so you will have tools to to put out markers. Uh, I think that's already in the making. I'm not entirely sure. That's like, like it's never really my biggest problem during surgery. But <laughs> maybe I'm just uh, maybe that's just me. But yeah. I mean, the, the tools I've seen that are pretty useful is, is those tools where, who provide an augmentation of the intraoperative imaging. You know, for starting surgeons, for residents to run, that don't have a lot of experience when you're alone there in the night, trying to decide what does this line mean, it, that could be pretty useful. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. So I, I always during training, during uh, like when you when you learn the trade, that's uh, that's a given. Like yeah. Uh, and I think uh, in ChatGPT, one of the nicest parts was where you have this discussion with it. And then you can like, I don't really understand this concept. Can you explain it to me? Mm -hmm. uh, and then you have some part which, and, and it never gets angry with you. It's <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Okay, of course. Never I'll, impatient. Yeah. I'll absolutely answer the question. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, I'm, uh, well, finally <laughs> someone that wants to answer my stupid questions. <laughs> uh, excellent. So, yeah. Hey. Well, uh, thanks a lot for, for the contributions. I'm already looking forward to, to our next session. And uh, there I hope to dive more into the orthopedic side of things because you're also heavily involved. So from our conversation today, I take it with me that um, we the most useful applications of AI are going to be working or are going to be saving us time in those uh, administrative stuff that we anyway spend time but could save time just organizational also it will be an augmentation of the of the diagnostic capabilities not to say there is a fracture but maybe to think beyond and understand what are the possible treatments and their implications and finally uh, to adapt the treatments to the patients based on their own uh, risk profile and even go one step further and uh, simplify the explanation so that they are really taking part in the decision mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't think we've touched that much on the administrative details, but that's going to be huge. We, we need to leave that for a different ep episode. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Hey, Max, thanks a lot for the time and uh, already looking forward for the next time. Thank you.